بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد أحبت في الله Continuing on our study of Hadi Dawatana wa Aqidatana Aqidatana by Imam Mukbil bin Hadi Al Wadi Allah Yahamu. The Imam said, Rahmatullahi, Wa Emma Jamata Tablik, Fa Alaika Ma Katabahu Al Akhal Fadl Muhammad ibn Abdu Wahab al Wasabi Fakala Havdahullah. يعملون بالأحاديث ضعيفة بل وموضوعة وما لا أصل لها وتوجد فيهم بدع كثيرة بل إن دعوتهم مبنية على البدع إذ عمود دعوتهم الفقر هو الخروج بهذا التحديد من كل شهر ثلاثة أيام ثلاثة أيام وفي سنة أربعين يوما وفي عمر أربعين أشهر أشهر وفي كل أسبوع وفي كل أسبوع جولتان جولة في المسجد الذي تصلي فيه وثانية متنقلة وفي كل يوم حلقتان حلقة في المسجد الذي تصلي فيه وثانية في البيت في البيت ولن يرضى عن شخص إلا إذا التزمه ولا شك أنه بدع في الدين ما أنزل الله بها من من سلطان. The Sheikh mentioned, Rahmatullahi, he said, as for Jamaat Tabliq, so after we had already discussed Akhwan Muslimin, he said, then <coughs> regarding them, it's upon you the what uh, the brother, the brother, the upstanding Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab al Wasabi, Hafizullah Ta'ala, who's one of the Mashaykh, one of the senior scholars of Ahlul Sunnati Wal Jama'ah in Yemen uh, in this present time. Uh, he said, it's, it's upon you what the Sheikh wrote, what uh, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab Wasabi wrote. And he said, in discussing, uh, this is what Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab al Wasabi, half of Allah Ta'ala, he wrote regarding Jamaat al Tabligh. He said that they uh, practice their methodology with a hadith that are weak. Rather, some of them are totally fabricated. And have no foundation, no, uh, they're not sourced in the religion at all. And you'll find in them a lot of innovation. Rather, that their da'wah is built upon ignorance, uh, built, built upon innovation. And that a pillar of their da'wah is that a person makes khuruj, meaning that a person uh, travels throughout the land with these restrictions, and these are the restrictions or the restraints or the pillars of their, what they consider to be khuruj, that they go out uh, every, mo uh, every month, three days, and during the year, 40 days, and during their life, 40 months, and every week, there should be two jolatans, there should be two, um, you know, a jola going around the masajid and giving a bayan and things like this. There should be one in the mosque, in, in the masjid, that they pray in, that, that they pray in. And the second one should be in another masjid. And every day there should be two halakas. There should be two, uh, uh, you know, sittings that they, you know, make their shura and they, you know, do whatever they do, their counseling and their, their studies. He said a halakha in the masjid which they pray in and a halakha uh, in their homes. And they will not be pleased with anyone unless they uh, adhere to that. Meaning they adhere to their rigid 
Minhaj, your methodology of Tao. And no doubt, this is innovation in the religion, which Allah has not given permission to uh, any authority to them to innovate in. And with regards to this, Ahabatifillah, there is many Nusus, for example, there's the Hadith, which refers to the importance of being cautious about narrating fabricated and weak narrations and, and so forth, that we have to be very cautious and may Allah protect us from this. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَكَثْرَةِ الْحَدِيثِ عَنِّي فَمَنْ قَالَ عَلَيَّ فَلْيَقُولْ حَقٍ so in the hadith of Abi Qatada, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that was related in uh, Muslim Imam Ahmed, where the Prophet وسلم, uh, said, Beware of narrating many a hadith upon me. And someone who speaks about me then say something that is truthful or is uh, the reality or, or something that's truthful. And whoever lies about me and says something that I did not say then let him take his seat in the fire. And Imam al-Albani, he said in regards to the issue of narrating uh, weak narrations of the Prophet sallallahu he said, in the ba'd al-ulama al-muhaqqateen ala anna la ya'mal bil hadith al-da'if mutlaqin la fil ahkam wa la fi fada'il some of the people of hadith, and especially those uh, and from the muhakkikin, those ulama that uh, go over those masail and, and make tarjih, they say, they some of them say don't, don't use, they completely uh, prohibit using and practicing weak narrations on the Prophet ﷺ, weak hadith. And they said not even regarding to ahkam, meaning rulings, you know, fiqh rulings and so, so forth, whether it be salat, tahara, uh, buying, selling, jihad, whatever. And also not with regards to fada'il, meaning fada'il a'mal, doing righteous deeds and those things that soften the heart, the raqa'ik and so forth. And this is the statement of, it was narrated on Ibn Ma'in, this. So letting us know that some of the ulama totally prohibit using weak narrations. Whereas some, with conditions, they say that it's permissible uh, with regards to talking about the benefits of deeds. And there are certain conditions. And one of the conditions is that there, it is strengthened by other narrations, that the, the meaning of the hadith is, is sound. The meaning of it's sound, even there's weakness in the hadith, but the meaning is sound and can be uh, attributed and strengthened by other narrations of the Prophet Wasallam that mention this action or this deed that is, uh, the person's trying to practice. And along with that, one of the things with getting back to specifically about the Dawah of Bukhana Muslimin is that of course that they have a Sufi origin, Muhammad Ilyas and the Bayat and so forth. And for someone who wants to go into detail about those matters, they can uh, go to the many things that are translated out there. Or if they know Urdu, they can go to the some original sources. Those, 
those are very strong or if they know Arabic they can go to the many refutations but also there's refutations in Urdu and, and other languages and of course Muhammad uh, Ilyas was uh, uh, I believe a Pakistani in origin probably from Dioband but I'm not sure and that requires making uh, going back over it. But what we want to what we want to concern ourselves is in general about Jamaat Tabligh. So we'll try to finish this as brief as possible. Here's some of the other things that Imam Muqbil rahmatullahi said in some of his other books regarding Jamaat Tabligh. <coughs> and he said, "What can be criticized with respect to this Jamaat, with respect to this group, is number one the lack of concern with Aqidah." He said, perhaps a man amongst them will accompany them for 40 years and you will find him remaining on his innovated Aqidah or Aqidah consisting of shirk. And this is in opposition to the Sunnah since the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered Mu'adh ibn Jabal when he sent him to Yemen that he should begin by calling the people to the testimony that there is no none worthy of worship and truth except Allah alone and that Muhammad is his Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. This is the hadith, Haq Allah al-Ibadi wa Haq al-Ibadi Allah, that the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, you know, this is about the right of Allah, which is to be worshipped alone and not, uh, and not having any partners ascribed to him. So then Imam Muqbil rahmatullahi said, therefore the da'wah to Tawheed comes before every single thing, and the one who submits himself to Tawheed is prepared and ready to renounce and abandon everything that is in opposition to to the Sharia. So this is very important because you'll find that yes, the Jamaat al Tablik, they have their six pillars and one of them is Ikhlas or the Kalimat al-Ikhlas or what have you. And this is in reference to the Shahada. And you'll hear them talking about that. But you'll hear them talking about Rububi. And I also want to relate some very important real stories and situations as well. Uh, as it becomes munasib. So let's let's continue on. The second point Imam Mukbil mentioned about Jamaat al Tabliq is their lack of concern with knowledge. You will see one of them having spent 20 years on Khuruj, yet he still remains in his ignorance and in abandonment of a knowledge and goodness. Bukhari and Muslim have reported in their Sahihs that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, bihi khayran din. Whenever Allah wants good, uh, for someone, he gives him understanding of the religion. The caller to Allah is the most deserving of the people to have zeal and enthusiasm for the beneficial knowledge so that he can call people upon basira, clear evidence, sure knowledge with insight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we can have in Kareem, this is my way, say, this is my way, I call upon Allah upon basira, meaning this clear evidence and knowledge. I and whoever follows me and free is a law from all imperfections, and I am not of those who associate partners with the law. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that we have to have uh, basira, we have to have ilm. And Jamaat al you will see that they will have their people, they will have new shahadas. And I, I witnessed this, I believe last summer I was in a masjid in Washington State, in Bellevue, I'll just mention it, in the city of Bellevue. And the Jamaat came, and they gave a, a talk, and they had a, a basically a new shahada who had come made khuruj from California with the jama'ah. He got up, he stood up, and he couldn't even speak English hardly that well. And he was destroying whatever message they intended to think. So how can a person like this be calling people to tawheed, to oneness? He doesn't even know tawheed. He doesn't even know bid'ah from, uh, uh, from sunnah. He doesn't know kufr and shirk from iman and uh, and, and, and Tawheed. So how is it a person like this can give da'wah? So you have to be wary of this. And I see, we've seen it, the countless stories in the outer world in the non, uh, and around the world of this Jamaat and the many, many, many mistakes that are made because of da'wah with ignorance. And this is especially because they use the lay person to give da'wah when they should not be giving da'wah. May yurid Allahu bi khayran yifakho fiddin. Whenever Allah wants good for a person, he gives them understanding of the religion. So if you don't have understanding of the religion, you shouldn't be calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outside of the fold of what you're able to. Because Jawad al-Tablik, you'll see that they use Balagani wa ayah, which is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They use this as a hujjah or as a proof to say that, hey, everyone should give da'wah. But this is not the case. This is not the case. Because some people, they give da'wah and they cause more harm than good. Because they're not giving it based on knowledge. They're not giving it based on, based on hikmah. 
Some people have some knowledge, but they don't have any wisdom. They don't know when to say and what to say and to who to say it. All of those things are conditions with Dawah, that you have to know your audience. You have to know how to speak to your audience. You have to have knowledge of your audience and knowledge in general of the subject you're, you're calling to. So how is you can give Dawah when you don't have any of that? Well, law of Mustang. The third point Imam Mukbil mentioned, he said, falling short in conveying some of the matters and being heedless of a large part of the Sharia. And Allah the Exalted said, O you who believe, enter in Islam into, into it fully. That is to take Islam from all its aspects. Indeed, many of, many of the excelled people of knowledge flee from their da'wah for this reason. And we're not making it obligatory upon them to speak about those matters in which they are not capable to do so. And we do not permit them to speak of those matters about which they have no knowledge. But we say indeed is obligatory upon the caller to Allah that he speaks with justice due to his saying. And when you speak, then be just. And the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar, to speak the truth even if it was bitter. So you have to speak the haq and you have to speak about those things you have knowledge of and you have to speak about the religion. You can't uh, speak about things and you have no knowledge about it and make more mistakes than you do good. And as you see, Jamaat Tablik, they call mainly to the Salat. That's their whole purpose. So they're calling people to the Salat but they're not correcting their Aqidah. This is one of the biggest criticisms of them is their weakness in emphasizing Aqidah and that they'll call to one aspect of Tawheed, Rububiyah, the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is the creator of the heavens and earth, but they don't emphasize worshiping Allah alone because they feel this divides the Jama'ah and we're going to relate this a little more extensively very, uh, very shortly. The fourth point that Imam Mukbil rahmatullahi mentioned, he said is that they have a partisan Ship, you know, their Hizbiya towards the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa. They blind follow Abu Hanifa and his madhab. <coughs> and this is found in, amongst many of them. That doesn't mean all of them because you have some Jamaat of the Bleak that their asal is from other places in the Arab world and they may uh, be Hanbali and Fiqh or whatever. We're not talking about whatever your madhab and Fiqh is. We're not, that's not the concern, but it's to blind follow is the concern and that you reject the truth if it contradicts what you're following. This is what we're rejecting, what we're criticizing. And so uh, you'll find many of them, amongst many of them, they adhere to the uh, method of Abu Hanifa, but the caller to Allah, in fact, every Muslim, it is necessary for him to comply with and to submit to the evidence. And this is what Imam Muqbil, his da'wah was predominantly about, about what did qal Allah, qal Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa fahim as-salaf ummah. He was about the Nusus. And so he's emphasizing this and criticizing Jamaat al Tablik for this very fact that the Nasus is not always their primary concern, but their Medhab becomes more of their concern. And, and I can relate to the very masjid that I was talking to because I've had conversations with many of the brothers there from Jamaat al Tablik over the years. And I re recall one of them saying, brother, I don't take from contemporary scholars. Uh, so I, he didn't want to hear the evidence that I gave him that was... was uh, supported by one of the contemporary imams, Imam al-Albani, about the weakness of a hadith. He said, brother, I don't take from these contemporary scholars, and you can follow, and he mentioned a fabricated hadith. And so anyhow, then Imam Mukbil mentioned the ayat, and it's not befitting for a believing man or woman when Allah and his messenger have decreed a matter that they should have any choice in the, uh, after that in their affair. And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger, then he has strayed clearly. So this is very important. Then the Imam Mukbil said, So how can such a person call others to follow the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, yet he is the first of those to oppose the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? O you who believe, why do you say that which you do not do? Ya yaladina amanu, lima tukuluna ma la tafalu, qabara maqtan indallahi and tukulu and tukulu ma la tafalu. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, O you believe, why do you say that which you do not do? It is greatly detestable to Allah that you say that which you do not do. So this is very important because they, they call the people to follow the sunnah, follow the sunnah in these aspects, grow your beard, pray the salat, this and that and the other, but they leave off aspects of tawheed, they leave off the sunnah of knowledge, they leave off the many other things and they blind follow their madhab. How can you blind follow a madhab over the text? That doesn't mean rejecting madhabs, no. But it means that blind following, when it goes in opposition to the dalil, to the stronger evidence, then that's not permissible. And then he mentioned another ayat 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَتَعْمَرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرَ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَطْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِنُونَ In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do you enjoin al-bir, meaning uh, piety and righteousness, on the people and you forget to practice it yourselves while you recite the book? Have you then no sense? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reprimanding those people who call people to goodness but don't practice it themselves. And may Allah forgive us and bless us to practice his deen and practice what we preach. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. And forgive us of our many shortcomings in that matter. Ameen. And Shu'ayb uh, said, alayhi salatu wasalam, I wish not, and this is the Quran, Surah Al Hud, uh, I wish not in contradiction to you to do that which I forbid you. I only desire reform so far as I am able to the best of my power. So it's very important, habit of Allah, that uh, we practice what we preach. And this is what we find, Jamaat al Tabliq, if they are calling people to good, but yet their shortcomings in practice is because they blind follow in opposition to text, Nusus, and blind following their Imams and Muhammad Ilyas and those who, who, who came after him, who inherited that uh, Jamaat, then this is in opposition to uh, calling to good. And this is in opposition to what they're calling to when they do call to good. The fifth point uh, Imam Mukbu mentioned, he said, narrating weak and fabricated hadith and those hadith which have no foundation or basis. And this is one thing we already mentioned. The message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said, beware of narrating much from me for whoever ascribes something to me, then let him say the truth. And whoever says upon me that which I did not say, then let him find his seat in the hellfire. Wa'iyadhan billah, ruahu ahmed. And whoever says some of the people of knowledge have allowed the narrating of weak hadith, which are related to the virtues of the actions, then he is not compiled with the conditions they have attached to it. And that is that the hadith should not be very weak and that it should have some basis from other hadith and that acting by it should not become common and widespread. And additionally, it is not permissible to narrate except that which is established. And when he speaks with the weak and forged hadith, that which has no basis, then it is clear that it is not permissible to act upon it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So that's what Imam Mukbil said in his book, uh, Al-Makhraj Min Al-Fitna, regarding Jamaat al Another thing I want to mention, this is what uh, Sheikh Muhammad uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab al-Sabi, Hafidullah Ta'ala, was mentioning when he said, was criticizing Jamaat al uh about that they will not be pleased with you if you uh, disagree with them or you, you're not upon their methodology fully. They will not fully accept you. They will, uh, and we have real stories, and I'll tell you this true story. I was in Ethiopia, and uh, we went on a trip to do Dawa. We went to a village called Butajira. And it was in a particular tribal region. And anyhow, we went to go to Dawa, and we spent the night in a, a masjid and a group of us, some of the brothers, they went to do, they did dawah in the masjid we were, we were going to sleep in. And myself and another brother who was translating, they wanted me to tell my story of how I became Muslim and also give some words of encouragement to the youth there. So we went to another masjid. And by the way, aside from the story, there was hyenas everywhere, wild hyenas, and it was fascinating a trip. So we went anyhow to give our, our, our dawah there. The point being is the masjid which we slept in, it was, may Allah preserve the brother, he built it on his property. He had very beautiful uh, property that had green lands and a big river populated by hyenas and whatever other kind of wild animals there. And we slept in that masjid and the masjid, the reason he built the masjid, they related the story to me, because there was once so one of the brothers had come to give dawah and he, matter of fact, he gave the khutbah in one of the local masajid in that area. And this brother who built this masjid, he was an elderly brother, uh, was present at the Jumu'ah. And the brother was talking about Tawheed. All he was doing was talking about Tawheed. There was a group from Jamaat Tablik there. They became very angry because they felt that by speaking about Tawheed, uh, in all of its aspects about worshiping Allah alone and so forth, that you were causing division amongst the Ummah. They, their whole thing is to just get everyone to come back to the prayer. Really, they believe in rectifying the people through the prayer, which is a good point. 
Of course, you have to. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Al-Ahd Bainana wa Bainuhum As-Salat O Kama Qala Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That what is between us and what is between them is the prayer. فَمَنْ تَرَكَ صَلَاتِ فَكَدْ كَفْرَ Whoever leaves the prayer has disbelieved. So calling to the prayer is something good. You know, they have aspects which are aslan from the sharia. They have an asl. But it's how they do that asl is where they go into bid'ah. And then also the creed and, the, and their foundation which it was established upon. The point being is these particular brothers from Jamaat Tabliq, they beat the imam, they pulled him off the mimbar during the khutbah. During the khutbah. And they beat him. So this brother was in attendance at this Jumu'ah. And he asked the people later, you know, why was this? And then he found out because this brother's calling to Tawheed. And they didn't like that. They felt it divided the Ummah. And it was against their call to the Salat and the prayer. That shows you how muta'asim, how prejudiced and blind they were. And ignorant. That they felt Tawheed divided the Ummah. That we shouldn't talk about those things. And they, so much so that they, they were beating another Muslim. Took him off the mimbar. And beat him. This inspired this brother who had land and obviously has money. And he built this masjid. It was a very nice masjid. It was on his, we slept in the masjid next, right next to his house. His house was right next to the masjid on his property. So you have to go through his property gates and uh, to get to the masjid. It was, it was beautiful. And that was a source of good. And the point of mentioning the story is to show you some of the situations where you find groups from amongst Jamaat to Tabliq, that doesn't mean they're all violent and so forth, but we're talking about a trend that you find around the world of their rejecting knowledge and they're only calling to Rububiya, to the, to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, instead of calling completely to Tawheed, to the other aspects of Tawheed, like especially uh, Tawheed al uluhiyah that Allah, all your worship should be... Uh, directed to Allah alone, because that's why they're accepted in so many Sufi communities and communities that even have grave worship and things like this. Why? Why are they allowed? Because they don't say anything that disturbs those communities. Those communities can continue on making tawaf around graves and sacrifice to their dead and their imams and their saints, and they can continue with the grave and the masjid because the one giving dawah is not going to command the good and forbid the evil regarding this. He's only going to tell the people, call the people back to prayer. Call the people back to prayer. Call the people to khuruj. Call the people to make jola. That's what they're going to call them to. And he's not going to say anything about the grave that's right right behind his back. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil.